yeah, I think it was 2008, I hired Eldon. And honestly, I, you know, Ricky retired the year before and I hired Eldon out of kind of pressure because, you know, I, I didn't really feel like I, I needed, um, you know, needed him to win. Like, obviously, when I was working with Eldon, there was things that I learned about nutrition and just other other things that helped. But um, I just felt like it was like, you know, you hear I got hurt in 2007 when I was winning out their title, blew my ACL out and came to the Supercross season. And at that time, I, I just hired Eldon and we were doing all the training boot camp all that blew my ACL out again um, before the season but it was um, you know again like I, I felt like there were so many things in the industry that you you almost had to do the way you looked and you know your trainers and stuff and you know when I when I would show up with Eldon it was actually part of it was kind of nice because people already thought like you were just in shape by having the guy around um, but like I said before, I, I beat Ricky off powdered donuts and sugar water. Like, I mean, that's the truth. You know, I, I, I really didn't feel like I lost a lot of races because I was out of shape. You know, I lost it because I fell or something else or bike issues, but never, um, you know, I just purely got tired. Um, but when I when I started working with Eldon, it was, I think I did about a year, about a year straight of his program. And then I was burnt out. like. When I went 24-0, I was exhausted. Um, you know, I really wasn't having that much fun in between the weeks because it was always grinding, grinding, grinding. And, um, you know, so when we came in 2009, like the Supergrass season, it was literally like I was paying him to um, for, I guess, a look in, in my sense. You know, it was more kind of Eldon's with you. You know, you do some training and stuff like that. But I had to find some way to kind of have fun because – you know, I felt like the difference between me and Ricky and, and some of the other guys, like it was it was never only about just racing with me. Like there was always a standard that people I felt like people held me up to or, you know, pressure I put on myself. I, I came in the sport different. I did things different. So not only was the training hard and the racing hard, the mental aspect of everything else that I dealt with was was really hard when when I was doing you know, full-time training and in racing, like I was just exhausted. And, you know, I felt like I, there was no way I can continue to kind of do that. And so in 2009, um, I signed a deal with Yamaha and I ended up going to Supercross only. And I, honestly, I think that's what kind of extended my career a little bit longer because if I was doing both, I would have I would have definitely retired between all the stuff, the injuries and things like that, and then the training aspect, the the mental aspect, like doing both season and always expecting to win every single race you race in, um, it, it just got too exhausting. And um, so in 2009, I ended up winning that championship. Um, I ended up coming out with my TV show. Like there was, I got introduced to other things in, in the world, golfing and, and all that, which kind of extended my career. And I think I, I stayed with Eldon in 2010 and then we we parted ways for you know different reasons and you know the rest is history uh malcolm is has been you know his career kind of started off the way it the way it was now in the sense of malcolm had a lot of talent um you know when he came up he had every opportunity he had a track you know he had me um like there as far as from the outside looking in, it looked like he had everything possible to go winning. And um, I remember one time Malcolm crashing when he was like five or six and then literally quitting racing like for two years. He didn't want to do it. And I always, I always felt the hardest thing to, to do, the hardest thing for Malcolm to do would be to actually be motivated to actually want to go race. Cause he, he had a front row seat to, you know, how, how much the behind the scenes of like what I went through, you know, smiling on camera, but then being sad and mad in the motor home, like me and my dad getting into arguments or, you know, me and the team, like he was right there for all that. So as a brother of one, like you don't, you don't want to go through that. You don't want to, you know, live in the sense of where you, you're looking at somebody who's not really having like that much fun, but also like, you know, it was just going to be that much harder for him because everybody thought he had, everything you know and it, it's not about like um 
giving people stuff. It's about like their heart. And, you know, I felt like the longest time, you know, Malcolm just was into other things. And, you know, for me, it was, you know, he's my younger brother. Like I see what I went through, so I'm not gonna push him. But I also knew like, you know, how much harder it would be for him if he decided to do it. And now to see him like the basically do a 180 and, you know, really working his ass off and almost get the, I feel like some of the, his treatment and what he, you know, the rods and lack of rods is kind of unfair compared to a lot of other guys out there. I feel like that that's kind of hurt him because for somehow, I think people still look at him as like, he's my brother, like he, you know, you know, he, he has the money or he can get a rod or whatever it is. And, um, you know, I think Malcolm's taken that in a positive way and, and motivated himself and, and just, um, you know, in showing people and, and showing people that, you know, it, it is him and it's always been him. And, you know, I think he's, which I'm proud of him. He hasn't listened to the people around him to try to twist the truth of what's going on. Like, you know, me, my parents, and we've always been there to support Malcolm um, for whatever he is. And, and Malcolm has been really busting his ass and, and for him to win that championship in 2016, like like I told him, like that was that was on you. Like, you know, not your team, not me. Like there was nothing besides you went out there and you did it yourself. And I think this year coming into Supercross, you know, I was, you know, I saw a couple of videos. I wasn't around much, but I saw a couple of videos of him riding and I knew there was a difference uh, in him, the way he was riding and unfortunately he got hurt. But hopefully like people like saw him, like Malcolm, I, I think would have been a championship contender. I mean, honestly, I mean, you see Cooper out there winning, like, I mean, people thought he was a bust. So there are so many things in this, in this sport, so many good riders in this sport and nobody's taken the ring of like, I want to be that number one guy. Um, so I think it's open. So the way Malcolm was riding, like, I mean, he definitely would have been up there and stuff. So I'm proud of him just to be where he's at right now um, as a human being and, and obviously my brother. And hopefully, um, you know, hopefully it's just the first step of him, you know, continue what he was doing in 2016 and on. Being a being a dad is it's it's changed my life. And I think it happened for me at the right time, like with me, you know, not racing anymore and all that stuff. I think if I wouldn't wouldn't have kids, I think my it would have been maybe harder for me because, you know, I, I wouldn't say I'd be lost, but there there definitely wouldn't be something I'd be looking forward to coming home to every day and, you know, really enjoying it and trying to give whatever I have all the injuries and crashes and everything being successful. I try to give that to them now. Um, but at the same time, like um, the way my dad raised me, they will respect respect people and they will earn it. And there's things as a father now you you're like, I'll never put my kids through that. Like I would never want my kids to, you know, be hungry or, you know, go through the things that I had to as a kid. But like I'll figure out a way for them to suffer, you know, and and it's cool. But yeah, being a dad is it's it's yeah I, I see the way my dad raised me and and i'm grateful for it yeah my my compound i've i've been to it maybe twice twice three times in three years and whatnot so i don't go over there anymore um i hate the smell of it uh my gym my gym stinks it it smells like work to me um every time i i come in the gates and it's funny because you build that, I built that place to be like amazing. Like you got this track, you got cars, you got all that stuff there. And I can't stand going over there. Uh, but then you have people who like fly in, like going to Disney World, like they come to take a photo in front of that, like just trying to get on it. Um, but to me, I, it's just work, it's work. I mean, I, I just remember so many times um, and I lived there for a long time, I, I lived on that property and I just remember all the times that waking up and knowing I gotta go to this bike ride or I'm driving 40 minutes to go over there to to ride and and 
like crashing and just whatever it is. Like I found out I was suspended, like sitting in that garage, you know, like all the stuff that's happened, you know, has been like at that house. And as much as I love it and I'm I'm so grateful for, I hate that place. Like I can't stand to go over there. Um, so going over there for the raw day and all that, like I literally dread dread going over there and, and riding. I, I sit there and stare at the bike and I'm like, nah, not today. But it's it's one of those things that like, I guess if you you live in something and, and you do it every day and like that's, that's literally your life, the way the dirt smells, um, you know, just coming in through the gate, going to the house, all that stuff, you do that every day. Like eventually when you don't have to do it, that's the last thing you're gonna go to, you know? So um, if I could find some way to do a live feed over there and watch Malcolm ride or never have to go, I would do it. So we should set that up anyway. Um, but yeah, the, the property is awesome, but you ain't gonna see my black ass over there. Yeah, the, the cool thing about um, the Ponderosa or the property compound, you know, I, I think when I started and I put lights on mine, so like I really kind of upped the standard to where all these compounds are now. Um, it it kind of set a tone and it, it, it almost made it uh, historic in a sense of where people you know, people wanted to see it. So when I had the opportunity to do the, the James Stewart, you know, at uh, spring championship in Freestone um, and have those guys to come down, it, it was actually really special because, you know, the way I feel about my property kind of gets overridden when I see other people and how happy they are, all the kids and stuff and how they really like look forward to, you know, coming there. So when we opened this up and, and had the, the kids come there, um, the only part that was hard for me is like they wanted me to ride and like I didn't want to ride, you know, even when I was riding, I really didn't want to ride like with them um, because just like the Golden State Warriors and LeBron James and Tiger, like you get your best from everybody. So like the C rider that's at Day City ain't a C rider when he's riding against me, like dude's an A rider. Uh, so they like the race. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, like this last year, I actually did enjoy it because I told myself, you know, weeks before that I ain't riding. I, I'm not riding, so don't even think about it. So I actually enjoyed being there, just watching the kids. I had my son there, um, you know, and he we was riding on golf carts and stuff. And, you know, just just enjoy being a father and enjoy watching these kids. So, you know, I think that I still, even being where I'm at in my life, I still haven't found the happiness of just riding. You know, like I, I still haven't let that part go. So I guess until I do that, where I can just enjoy being that 35 year old plus vet, um, you probably ain't gonna see me ride that much. I mean, I, I think at some point when, maybe after this video, maybe like once I tell everybody what's going on, maybe I can just be like, all right, like I, I'm gonna go ride. Cause I, I do, I do enjoy, I do enjoy riding. I don't enjoy racing and I don't enjoy like having to win. And I don't enjoy people thinking that I have to be spectacular because I am, but I don't want to be all the time. Um, and I think once, once that's kind of gone, it's kind of like when I st stopped training, I wanted to get fat. Like I wanted people to see me fat and like get over the sense of like, yeah, I am fat. Like I'm fat. Okay, like it is what it is. I'm not in 28s. I'm in 34s, 6s, you know? Like that's cool and I'm I'm comfortable with that. And once you know, once you get comfortable with it, you're like you're like whatever. Like, you know, Raj, send me an extra large t-shirt, man. I don't want to be tight. Like, you know why? <laughs> you know, so um I I think the same thing goes with like with anything. Like once you know people understand like, look, you know, I'm I I don't I'm I'm James Stewart, but I'm James Stewart the father. Then once you accept that and I accept that, then everything's good. Then maybe I would go race Loretta's. I always did say I was gonna go back and race Loretta Lens. I did say that. So yeah, I, I would enjoy doing that. Or hopefully not, but maybe uh my kids might want to go race, you know, and to be a peewee dad. So we'll see. I have fear every time I race. Um, from when I was on Pee Wee's until every race except for my last race. Um, 
but I, I got on the gate and I hated it. I hated racing. I hated everything about it. I couldn't stand the way this fuel smell. I couldn't stand the 30 second girls. You know, I couldn't stand uh, J-Bone or Patty or Oscar patting my gate. Like I hated it. Um, because I knew what was next. And it's the same thing like I, I thought when Christmas and November came around, like Thanksgiving and Christmas, I hated those days because I knew weeks later that we were gonna be on the gate for Anaheim. And now a part of me, it's when you've been a certain way, like since I can remember, um, I think basically like 15, uh, I've been that way for almost 20 years now it's hard to just change in like one year or, you know, and, and kind of get used to it. But the, the fear, the fear side of things, it was always me caring in the sense. And I think like when you care about something, you have the fear of like losing or you have the fear of failing. And I think I said at one time, like I was so afraid to lose, I scared myself to win. Like that's literally how I felt. And again, imagine like, how you most people feel when they go in the gate chad ricky you you know how y'all feel and then times that by like you have no choice but to win and like everybody expects you to win and when you get second place it was like what happened like what happened you know you're, you're talking with your buddies and like yeah such and such won or oh, oh what happened to james you know and like I heard that in my inner circle and the people around me, like that's the way you couldn't help it, but like that's the way everybody thought. So if they're thinking that way, imagine how I'm thinking. And so a part of that feeling on the gate was, it's the truth, like like I don't wanna lose. Like I don't wanna lose because the rest of my week's gonna suck. You know, like I don't wanna get third place because they're not gonna be like, man, you got third place. They'd be like, man, you got third place. Like what happened? And and doing that my whole life like it you know you get in the routine of like that 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 sucks and i expect it to win so it's nobody else's fault but my own like that's the way that's what made me who i am and that's why it was so hard for me to go all right i'm gonna just finish second or you know like just try to get points because my mindset wasn't it wasn't raised like that it was to go all in or don't that whole year i was on that kawasaki 250 i wrote that bitch every time so I crashed all the time because I was trying to override something that shouldn't have been out there. I should have just settled for 10th place because that's probably what all I had. But I was trying to race these four strokes up the hills and all that stuff. And, and again, like now thinking about like that, like years later, like I was so stupid. Like I was so stupid to think that I really had a chance like on that bike. And, but it also was hard to, to somehow accept that because I went from winning everything, going out there trying to winning races by a minute just because I wanted to win, to now I I can't I can't beat these guys. The team they're not gonna tell you like look, we know you can't win. You know you you know you can't win on this thing. They're gonna tell you like well train harder and do this and ride harder and that's what I was doing. So a part of me like felt it was on me. Like I felt like I just wasn't good enough and now like now like i'm such an idiot and i could have saved some aches and pains on monday morning but no i i i did it and honestly if i can go back i'd do that same thing again because that's what made me who i am and um unfortunately like i had to go through it but i also think like in a way it definitely hurt me um but it also made me stronger um in the sense of you know, like never giving up and, and when people thought you didn't have a chance, like still trying to go out there and fight for it. The Probably the one of the worst races I ever had in my life was Hangtown 2005. I, I think I crashed like three times in one lap. It was the first 250 outdoor race and honestly, I showed up at the gate thinking I was gonna wax Ricky and Chad, <laughs> all those guys, and boy, did I get my ass kicked that day. Um, yeah, and I remember the night before in the motorhome, I was sick. I was sick to my stomach. I was throwing up for no reason. I think it was because I was so nervous. Um, but still, I I thought I was going to wax them dudes. Like, yeah, you know what? I just went through the whole two-stroke versus four-stroke stuff on 125s. 
these guys ain't got nothing. And boy, I took off in the gate and it sounded like a space shuttle was around me and they just ran past me. And I don't know if I fell in first corner, second corner, third corner, probably fell in all three of them. But um, I just remember crashing, crashing, crashing. And I didn't, I didn't even finish the moto. Um, I think I crashed too many times. But yeah, that was the one race that I was like, like, <laughs> dude, you crazy. So what did I do? I upped it and I went to to Mount Morris thinking like that was an anomaly that like that didn't happen. Like I'm gonna wax these dudes again. And man, Ricky came past me and I tried cutting him off going up a hill and dude just like literally I mean he just ran over me. Like he like knocked me down. Um going up a hill, he had too much damn power. And uh, so what did I do? I did that same thing again the next time I showed up and I just kept crashing and crashing and finally I think I realized that I ain't really got no chance. We'll just prepare for Supercross.